I'm Chelsea. A few weeks ago, my father, who had been battling illness, passed away. <sighs> I wish I could have shown him his grandchildren. Such words escaped my lips, along with a sigh. I got married when I was 25. That was exactly five years ago. At my wedding, my father and I made a promise. I'll let you know first when I get pregnant. But that promise remained unfulfilled. That's about the only regret I have about my father. Since his illness was discovered a year ago, I've done everything I could for him. I regularly returned to my parents' home and visited the hospital with my mother. I increased the frequency of phone calls and video chats. I did everything I could think of. Still, I can't help but wonder, could I have done more? I muttered. My mother sitting next to me reassured me. You did well, Chelsea. Really? Yes, your father would be satisfied. Just then, my sister Portia returned. I'm back, brought the lawyer. My sister entered the living room saying so. Behind her was a man in his mid-forties. I assumed he was the lawyer, and he handed me his business card. I'm Samuel, the attorney. Thank you for coming. Please have a seat. Excuse me, then. My mother guided the lawyer Samuel to his seat. As soon as he sat down, my sister blurted out, I heard from this lawyer that Dad left quite an inheritance. It's not all for you, Portia. I know that. My sister, now in a bad mood, glared at me. I glared back. My sister and I don't get along. We used to be okay. But things turned sour when we found out about Dad's illness. One reason was my sister's arrogant attitude. No matter how many times I reached out, she never visited our father. Of course, I may have said it wrong. I might have been a bit harsh because I was worried about him, but her reaction was also a problem. You're not a child. You don't have to be so stubborn. When I said that, my sister retorted, I'm not being stubborn. I live in the city. It's not easy to come. It's the countryside. But you can get here in two hours by car. Those two hours are tough. It costs money. It's money that's important to you? Of course it is. I'm busy, so stop contacting me. And with that, she finally stopped talking. Even if she lives far away, she could visit once in a while. I always thought so. That's why our relationship deteriorated so quickly. In the end, my sister never visited our father, so our relationship remained strained. Sensing the tension, the lawyer intervened. Let's calm down, please. Okay, I'm sorry. I apologized, and the lawyer nodded before continuing. As I mentioned on the phone, I have your husband's will. When did this happen? My mother murmured. A few weeks before he passed away, he contacted me. So you went to the hospital? Yes. I had him write the will in front of me, with his primary physician present. It turns out they had arranged for the primary physician to contact the lawyer when my father passed away. So after my father passed away, he contacted the lawyer. In turn, the lawyer reached out to us. That's how it happened, and why I'm contacting you now, the lawyer said pulling out a white envelope. He placed it in front of us. This is the will. That's definitely Dad's handwriting, I muttered, verifying the characters on the envelope. My sister Portia seemed a bit sulky. Never mind, just tell us what's in it. I'm busy, you know. Very well, the lawyer said with a wry smile, opening the envelope. Inside was a single piece of paper. This is what was written there. It stated that besides the house and land, my father's inheritance included some savings and a storage shed. We knew about the house and land, but what's this about a storage shed? As I was pondering this, my sister angrily said to the lawyer, Wait a minute, you didn't mention the farm. The farm? Yes, the farm dad used to work on as a hobby. My father used to run a company in the next town, but after turning 50, he began to feel his age. I'm thinking of closing the company. I want to take it easy. Is that okay? I heard this when I was in high school. My sister, who was in college at the time, opposed it, but my mother and I, concerned about my father's health, agreed. Don't worry about the money, Portia. We have enough savings. My father reassured her. Reluctantly, she agreed. After that, my father really did close his company and started farming near our home. It feels good to move my body while farming, he said, looking happy. Seeing him like that, I felt glad I had agreed. But my sister didn't seem to feel the same. 
She had said she would return home after graduating from college, but instead, she got a job near her university. Eventually, she married the CEO of an IT company she met through work. Anyway, that's why father was farming until he got sick. My sister insists that the farm should also be part of the inheritance. The lawyer reviewed the documents after hearing this from my sister. He quickly found a note and said, The farm is rented land. Rented? I thought we owned a large piece of land, my sister said, disappointed. Indeed, the farm where my father grew vegetables was spacious, but it might be too much for us, who know nothing about farming. Maybe it's good that it's rented. That's what I thought. The conversation then shifted to dividing the inheritance. As for the division of the inheritance, the house and land go to the wife. The lawyer said. My sister grinned. So we can divide the rest however we want? Please divide the savings and storage shed fairly between you two. Savings means cash, right? I'll take the cash. How much is it? The savings amount to about $100,000. There's no need to pay inheritance tax for this amount. Then I'll take the 100000 in cash. My sister declared triumphantly. But I couldn't agree with such a selfish arrangement. I strongly protested against my sister. Wait a minute. I object. Why? I'm the eldest daughter. That's irrelevant. You can have the storage shed. What even that is? What even is that, anyway? My sister turned back to the lawyer. Flipping through the documents, the lawyer answered. It's the storage shed next to the farm. You will inherit the building, the land, and its contents. With land? My sister's eyes lit up. Even though she's married to the CEO of an IT company, does she still want more money? As I was wondering this, the lawyer told my sister the following. The land comes with it, but it's about 65 square feet, roughly the size of a small bedroom. A small bedroom? Yes, here are the photos. The lawyer placed photos of the shed on the table. Pictures of both the interior and exterior were displayed. The exterior clearly looked like a rundown shack. The inside contained only basic tools like hoes, scissors, and shovels. Nothing that seemed valuable. I don't want it. My sister grimaced. I peeked at the photos, too. It was all very ordinary. These are sentimental items, but they won't bring in money. As I was thinking this, my sister spoke. Fine, I'll take the cash. You can have that dirty shed. Hold on, that's not fair. You agreed to the vegetable farming. What are you complaining about now? Uh, it was hard to argue when she put it that way. Still, if I didn't say something, she'd take all of Dad's inheritance. So we're good then, my sister pressed me. As I struggled to answer, my mother chimed in. As long as Portia won't complain later, I have no objections. There's no way I would. Then Portia gets the cash and Chelsea gets the shed. Okay, it's settled then, my sister grinned. Feeling uneasy, I immediately objected. Well, I'm not satisfied. Oh, give it up. But you're so greedy, aren't you? That's not it. You're such a hassle. You care more about dad than money, right? My sister's words left me speechless. Of course, family is more important than money. Money is important, but it's not something to compare with family. While I was thinking this, my sister quickly ended the conversation. In the end, my mother got the house and land, my sister got dad's savings, all that was left for me was the dirty shed. After that, my sister signed a document promising not to complain about the inheritance division. <laughs> she left, laughing loudly. I was full of complaints. I couldn't help but vent to my mother. Mom, why didn't you help me? I did help you. How? You just sided with Portia. That's not true. I made sure you got the shed. Huh? I'm not happy about getting that shed. You might find something surprisingly good if you look closely. My mother said with a smile. I could only puff out my cheeks in response. The next day, I took the key from the lawyer and headed to the shed near the field. It was a ten minute walk from home. A rural road where no one else passed by. I finally reached the field my father had rented. For the past year... He had been hospitalized, so the field was empty. I opened the shed with the key. Wow, <laughs> it's dusty. The shed was quite dusty, probably because no one had cleaned it. 
Still, there might be something sentimental from Dad. Thinking this, I looked around the shed. Nothing special here. It was just a dirty shed after all. All I found were tools Dad had used for farming. They could be considered sentimental, but they weren't anything special. Maybe I should just take what's inside for now. I mumbled, looking around the shed. That's when I noticed something. Huh. It looks smaller than from the outside. Maybe it was the dim light, but the inside of the shed felt a bit cramped. Is it just my imagination? Thinking this way, I stepped outside the shed, but something still felt off. After pondering for a bit, I decided to walk around to the back of the shed. The backside was adjacent to a thicket of various trees. To my surprise, there was another door there. Wait, another entrance at the back? I gasped. When I looked from inside the shed, there was only a wall, meaning the only entrance was the door I had used. Yet from the back, there was a door. What's going on? I thought about it. A door on the back should be visible from inside too, but it wasn't. That meant there had to be a wall in between. In other words, there was a space accessible only from the back. The moment I realized this, I got excited. This must be Dad's surprise. Dad always loved surprises. He even surprised me on my birthdays. Memories flooded back, and I found myself tearing up. I quickly returned inside the shed and began searching for the back door key. If it was Dad, he would have hidden it somewhere in the shed. With that gut feeling, I rummaged through the shed. After a while, I found two keys hidden in the handle of a shovel. I went around to the back and tried one of the keys in the door. With a click, the door opened. What could be in here? The space inside was indeed cramped, only about three feet wide. A large safe stood alone in the space. Is this from Dad's company? I recognized the safe. It was the same one I saw in the corner of his office when I was a child. Nostalgic. I hugged the safe. This was a true memory of my father. I felt fulfilled. This alone made the inheritance worthwhile. But knowing Dad, this couldn't be the end. There's got to be more surprises. I muttered and inserted the second key into the safe. With a slightly rusty sound, the safe opened. What? No way. The moment I saw the contents, I was stunned. Inside was an unexpected inheritance. What should I do? Oh, I have to tell mom. I locked the safe and rushed to my mother. After explaining the situation to her, I called my husband, and with his help, we moved the safe from my parents' house. Then it hit me. The contents of the safe were undoubtedly dad's. However, if it's part of my inheritance, including the shed, I might have to pay inheritance tax. Better get this checked out thoroughly. The contents of the safe were clearly valuable. I decided to consult the lawyer. Inheritance tax? Well, that you should. According to the lawyer, it's better to consult a certified public accountant. So I got a referral to an accountant from a friend. I left all the complicated matters to that accountant. Half a year passed in this way. Just when I thought things had finally settled down, my sister showed up near my home. What brings you here all of a sudden? Uh, well, I had some business at our parents' house. So you stopped by? Yeah, something like that. My sister's behavior was strange. It's funny, no matter how you look at it. Even if my home is close to our parents, it's still a 20-minute drive. We're not the kind of sisters who would casually visit, especially after the tension over dad's inheritance. It's not a relationship that comes to play carelessly. I couldn't shake off my suspicion as I looked at her. Meanwhile, my sister, acting a bit nervous, asked, Can I come in? Sure, but what's the matter? I have something to talk about, my sister said, forcing a smile. Reluctantly, I let my sister into the house. After I served some coffee, she started to fidget and then began to speak. So, did you win the lottery or something? What? No, I didn't. Then did your husband get a bonus? I tilted my head, puzzled. I never buy lottery tickets because I'm not interested. My husband, who's a salaried worker, does get a holiday bonus, but it's not that time of year. 
What on earth is she talking about? Confused, I asked her directly. Hey, what are you talking about? Suddenly, my sister got angry. What? Are you making fun of me? No, what are you talking about? Money, money, you have it, don't you? Money? Yes, I heard about it. My sister began to speak excitedly. It was a story from a few days ago. Living in the city, my sister had run into our aunt by chance. The woman started the conversation like this. I know how hard it's been for you since you lost your father. Are you doing okay? Yes, well, I visited him many times when he was sick. Thank you. But you must be relieved, right? Getting such a big thank you gift. Thank you gift? Yes, your sister sent me a $500 gift card as a thank you for visiting him. A gift card? Needless to say, what caught my sister's attention was the gift card. Hearing that I had sent it, she was convinced I had come into some extra money. You got a windfall, didn't you? Just admit it. My sister interrogated me. Ah, that's what this is about. <sighs> I sighed. My sister didn't like my attitude and yelled. What's with that attitude? Are you mocking me? No, it was a thank you gift. So where did you get the money for it? That's what I want to know. From the inheritance, remember? Inheritance? Yes, I got the inheritance. So I sent thank you gifts to relatives who had helped us. Upon hearing this, my sister frowned. All you got was that dirty shed. Yes, that's true. But you can't sell that for money. But there was a safe inside it. That's where the real inheritance was. A safe? Real inheritance? I carefully explained to her about the watches in the safe. They were all valuable, collected by my father as a hobby during his lifetime. However, I didn't know their exact value. On the other hand, the remaining savings were about $100,000. Considering he was a business owner who could retire early, that amount seemed small. That led me to think he might have invested a lot in those watches. If they're valuable, you'll have to pay inheritance tax. My mother had said after seeing the contents of the safe. What should I do, Mom? When I asked, my mother thought for a moment and advised. Things like this always come out. You should declare it properly. How? Well, let's ask that lawyer we spoke to recently. So I consulted the lawyer again. I was told that if you inherit valuables, the inheritance tax is determined by their value at that time. I was also told that a certified public accountant could handle it for me so I left it to the accountant. As a result, it was found the watches alone were worth at least $500,000. With watches this valuable, you'll have to pay inheritance tax. How should I pay it? How about keeping the ones you're emotionally attached to and selling the rest? Certainly, it doesn't make sense to me, who doesn't know the value, to hold on to such expensive watches. I'd rather someone who understands their worth have them. With that thought, I sold some of the watches. I used the money from the sale to pay the inheritance tax and sent thank you gifts to the relatives who had helped us. Those thank you gifts were the gift cards my sister was talking about. By the way, what I kept were items like the pocket watch my father often wore. I showed my sister the pocket watch as I told her this story. This one isn't expensive, but it holds the most memories for me. However, my sister frowned upon hearing my story. What? You don't have any left? No, there are still some in the safe. Where's the safe? It's at Mom's. The safe is too big for this house. It's the one Dad used at his company. Hmm. My sister looked away, seeming deep in thought. I felt uneasy seeing her like this. But right after that, she stood up and said, I'm leaving, now that I know where the money came from, and left. Considering how money-minded my sister is, I thought she might demand some of the money from the watch sales. I was relieved she left without making a fuss. However, in my relief, I forgot the unease I had felt earlier. My sister isn't that understanding. I had forgotten that. I was reminded of this late that night, when I got a call from my mother. Chelsea, it's urgent. Come over right away. What happened, Mom? It's just really bad. My mother was frantic and unclear. My husband and I rushed to my mother's house. As we approached, we noticed something strange. The area around my parents' house was lit up in red. What's going on? The reason became clear as we got closer. 
Several police cars were parked outside my parents' house. I pushed through the crowd and called out to my mother. What happened, Mom? Well, Chelsea, you see? According to my mother, it was after 9 p.m. Feeling tired, she had gone to bed already. Soon after, she heard strange noises. Sounds like someone searching for something came from beyond the door. Oh, it's a burglar! That's what my mother thought instantly. However, she was the only one in the house. Feeling helpless, she decided to escape through the window. Looking back, she saw the light of a flashlight moving inside the house. This is definitely a burglar! Convinced, she ran to the neighbor's house and said, Help! There's a burglar! Hearing this, the neighbor immediately came out. They too saw the swaying light my mother was pointing at and called the police, thinking it was a burglar. However, it wasn't a burglar at all. It was my sister, who had sneaked into the house. She had gone to rummage through the safe after hearing my story. Neither my mother nor the neighbor had any way of knowing this. Soon the police arrived, and naturally my sister was shocked. Realizing she was in trouble, she tried to make a quick escape. Of course, it's her own family home, so there's no need to run. Yet in her panic, my sister thought she had to escape. In her rush, she bumped into the open door of the safe. Just then, the already unstable safe toppled over, falling right onto her as she tried to flee. So Portia got trapped under it? Yes, that's what happened. Is she okay? She was taken to the hospital by ambulance, but she keeps saying her leg hurts. What on earth was she thinking? I was truly dumbfounded. Afterward, my mother and I apologized to the police officers who had come to help, feeling bad for calling so late. I also phoned my sister's husband. Wait, you're saying Portia broke into her own family home and got injured? Yes, that's correct. What is Portia doing? She doesn't even do housework. I'm really sorry about my sister. That's it. I'm filing for divorce. Divorce? Actually, according to my sister's husband, she had racked up a considerable amount of debt. Apparently, she had been spending a lot on brand name items. He had just found out, and they had a huge fight. In the end, my sister stormed out of the house saying, I'll borrow it from mom and pay it back. Turns out, she had already used the $100,000 she inherited to pay off her debts. Still short, she came to me to scrounge for more money. Learning about the contents of the safe led to her actions, which in turn led to this whole mess. No wonder her husband was furious. In the end, my sister, who had fractured her leg, was hospitalized. Her husband came to the hospital and started talking about divorce. Naturally, my sister made a scene. I'm not getting a divorce, absolutely not. But it was too late. Her husband had brought the divorce papers. Seeing them, she had no choice but to sign. Now she's lying in her hospital bed, stunned. There's a part-time job magazine next to her, so she's probably planning to start working part-time to pay off her debts. That would be a relief for me. As for me, I decided to move back to my parents' home after all the commotion. Of course, I'm worried about my mother, but there's another reason. I found out I'm pregnant. My husband and I talked it over and decided to move back home and have my mother help us with the children and childcare. I wish I could have told my father about the pregnancy while he was alive, but I'm sure he would be happy for us. So I'm looking forward to giving birth to a healthy baby. I want chocolate cake now. Go buy it for me. Lying in bed, feeling terrible, my crazy mother-in-law, Grace, demanded that I get her a cake right away. I finally lost it with this woman who was making a racket above my head. Would you just shut up? Listen, I've got a month left to live. Go get your own damn cake, you idiot. My name is Olivia, and I'm 28 years old. I met my husband David through a friend, and we got married after dating for three years. We don't have any kids yet, but we're enjoying our time together. David's family owns a small factory with about 30 employees, they're doing pretty well in their area. The company was founded by my late father-in-law, and I heard from David that it grew with the combined efforts of the employees. 
Now David's sister Sophia is running the company as the CEO. By the way, she's not married. Sophia has a knack for business, and the company's performance has improved recently. Must be Sophia's great communication skills, just like Mom, David said. Sophia was indeed friendly and approachable, even to me when we first met. I'm Sophia, your sister-in-law. I'm so happy to have such a cute sister. She grabbed my hand and said this with a wonderful smile. As someone who only has brothers, I was also happy to feel like I had gained a sister. So far, it sounds like I have nothing to complain about, but that's not the case. The problem is my mother-in-law. Our company has coffee breaks at 10 a.m. and 3 p.m., and I really hate those times. And here's why. Sorry, Olivia. I'm a bit tied up. Could you get Mom's coffee? When I hear that, my mood instantly drops. The family home is next to the factory, and my mother-in-law chose to retire and stay home after my father-in-law passed away. However, she seemed to cherish this coffee break, saying... I've been waiting for you. So, Olivia, I wanted to talk to Sophia. She gave me a blatantly disappointed look. Naturally, she wasn't in a good mood. And as she was about to leave with a wry smile, she said, Hey, I have something to say to you, so sit here. And then she complains to me until the break is over. So, you've been married for three years and still no kids. What can I do? Having kids isn't something you can control. And if I stay quiet, she gets even more irritated. Why such a gloomy face? I wonder why David chose someone like you. Plus, given your parents, who knows how long you'll live. <sighs> the sooner the better. She said that with a sigh. Hearing her say that, especially about my parents, really gets me down. And there's a reason for that. When David and I decided to get married and went to meet his family, this happened. What? You don't have parents? My mother-in-law looked shocked when I told her. Of course, it's not like I never had parents. My mom passed away from cancer when I was 10, and my dad died of a heart attack 10 years later when I was 20. My memories of my mom are vague, but my dad raised my brother and me all by himself. I deeply regret that he passed away before I could repay his kindness. When people hear about my situation, they usually look at me with pity and say, You must have had a hard time. But my mother-in-law was different. So, you might not live long either, huh? She actually said that while I was stunned by her response. What a rude thing to say. How insensitive. My husband David said, Despite that, my mother-in-law kept grumbling, insisting it was an important issue. Should I reconsider this marriage? Just as I was thinking that, Sophia, who had been quiet until then, slammed her hand on the table and said, What are you talking about? Said so quietly, everyone in the room froze. Then my mother-in-law said, Right, Sophia, you agree with me, don't you? That's what she said. Sophia coldly responded. What? I told Mom, David chose Olivia himself, and she's wonderful. Why can't you support that? That's what she told my mother-in-law, with cold eyes. This seemed to shock my mother-in-law, who adores her daughter. From then on, she stopped making snide comments, except when we were alone. Even during the twice-daily coffee breaks, she looked disappointed when I brought her coffee instead of Sophia. David and I rented a room near his family home, so the only time I had to endure her complaints was during those ten-minute coffee breaks. I'm so glad we don't live together. But my peace was suddenly shattered. That year, a record-breaking hurricane brought a lot of misfortune my way. Olivia, hurry! Something terrible has happened. I'd never heard David sound so panicked. I rushed to the living room to find it in complete disarray. What is this? Our ceiling was leaking terribly due to the hurricane. It wasn't just our room. The owner contacted us to say it was the same in other rooms. 
it seemed impossible to repair while living there, so we had to find temporary housing. Sophia cheerfully suggested, Why are you worrying? Just live with us. Your commute will be 30 seconds. Sophia said that with an innocent look on her face. So, we ended up staying with David's family for a while. Welcome home, David. The leak must have been tough, but Mom is happy we can live together again. My mother-in-law greeted us cheerfully, but David mostly ignored her, like a teenager in a rebellious phase. And finally, she said, Oh, Olivia, you're here too. I didn't notice because you're so quiet. Smile more. Frustrated, my husband made a face, and all I could do was force a smile, knowing we'd be staying there for a while. After moving in together, I witnessed something quite peculiar. The first time I saw it was during dinner on our first night living together. Wanting to show my gratitude, I cooked dinner. Bread, soup, and steak. It wasn't a glamorous menu, but my mother-in-law and sister-in-law said it was delicious and ate it all. I remember feeling genuinely relieved. After a while, my mother-in-law suddenly got up and brought a container from the fridge. <laughs> Humming a tune, she opened it and piled a ton of its contents onto her steak. Ugh, Mom, you're still eating that stuff? My husband sitting next to me looked disgusted. Sophia, my sister-in-law, rolled her eyes and said, She won't stop, no matter how many times I tell her. I've given up. <laughs> she then burst into laughter. At first, I couldn't tell what was on top of the steak. Upon closer inspection, I realized it was jam. While sweet sauces on meat aren't unheard of, Adding jam to a seasoned steak was just bizarre. When you eat something salty, you crave something sweet, right? That's why, she said, looking quite pleased with herself. Honestly, it gave me heartburn just watching her. For the record, I'm not a fan of sweet sauces on meat. Come on, Olivia, why don't you try it? It's delicious, mother-in-law said, turning to me for the first time. I didn't want to eat it either but I forced a smile. Apparently, that wasn't the reaction she was hoping for. I'm recommending it for a reason. You might live longer if you follow my example. With that parting shot, she retreated to her room. I was left speechless as she stormed off. My husband and sister-in-law apologized, saying, Sorry. Sorry. Mom's at it again with her nonsense. Apparently, mother-in-law has a serious sweet tooth and doesn't feel her day is complete without eating a cake. Amazingly, her annual health checkups always come back normal. Come to think of it, she's always eating cake during our 3 p.m. coffee breaks. I remember that. I like cake too, but not every day. It would get monotonous. And what about blood sugar levels? I've always been cautious about my health, especially since both my parents had short lifespans. So, mother-in-law's jam steak was quite a shock. Wait, does Sophia buy the cake every day? Caught off guard, Sophia admitted. Yeah, she makes me go buy it. She says it's embarrassing for her to do it herself. Thanks to that, I've become good friends with all the local cake shops. <laughs> Sophia said, laughing. Watching this, my husband David said, Sophia, this isn't a laughing matter. Mom's getting older. She needs to start caring about her health. I've always left it to Sophia to deal with Mom, and I feel bad about it. With that, my husband continued to look exasperated. Well, I think you guys will have to help out more from now on, Sophia said with a cheerful face, and I braced myself for more interactions with mother-in-law. Living with my in-laws made my commute much shorter, so I took the initiative to do household chores before and after work. I tried to engage my mother-in-law in conversation, but she often gave me the cold shoulder or outright ignored me. Despite that, she never missed an opportunity to complain about the kids during our coffee breaks. Since moving here, I've had more bad days. Must be the stress. <sighs> my spirits were low. My husband noticed... 
and offered multiple times to go to the doctor with me. Let's move out and stay at a hotel temporarily. He suggested, but I declined, because it felt like a waste of money, and the nearest hotel was still a bit far. Then, the worst thing happened. A business trip for a whole week? I was speechless at the news from my husband. The reason for my despair? Sophia, my sister-in-law, would be going too, meaning I'd be alone with mother-in-law. Yes, I'm saying that. My husband offered to take me with him, but I thought it's just a week. I hope I can handle it, especially since I still wasn't feeling well. On the day they left, Sophia sent me a mother-in-law survival guide to my phone. If anything happens, just feed her cake and you'll be fine. <laughs> I couldn't help but laugh. The list included local cake shops and mother-in-law's favorite cakes from each. For someone like me, who was bracing for a tough week, this info was a godsend. In a week, our home renovations would be done and we could move back. I thought I could manage, but that optimism crumbled on the first night. When I returned from work, mother-in-law was blocking the entrance. You know why I'm angry, don't you? No, I don't. I'm not psychic. Losing patience, mother-in-law snapped. You missed both the 10 a.m. and 3 p.m. coffee breaks today. Her words caught me off guard. Indeed, with my husband and Sophia away and end-of-month tasks piling up, I'd completely forgotten about mother-in-law's coffee breaks and I myself never had a coffee break. I thought she'd understand since she used to work, but she yelled, The moment we're alone, you start this harassment? You wicked woman! She said that with an angry look on her face. I felt a huge disconnect with her. Why am I getting yelled at like this? Do I deserve to be called wicked? Suppressing my anger, I thought, It's just a few more days, and said, I did buy cake during my lunch break. It's in the office fridge. Sorry I didn't bring it. Here you go. Her face instantly changed from angry to smiling. Let's forget about today. Don't forget tomorrow, okay? She said and cheerfully went back to her room. I'll just call her the cake demon from now on. From then on, I never forgot the coffee breaks, knowing how troublesome it would be to upset mother-in-law. On the day my husband and Sophia were due back, I felt so stressed that I was hit with nausea, headaches, and a loss of appetite. I took the day off and went to the hospital. It's pretty bad. Can your family come right away? I couldn't stop crying at the doctor's words. I was told I have cancer, and at most six months, maybe even just one month to live. I returned home. My face tear-streaked and my body shaky, and lay down on the bed. The door burst open. What are you doing skipping work? Sophia and David are working hard and you're slacking off? Her screeching worsened my headache. I didn't have the energy to respond, so I just said, I'm not feeling well, and closed my eyes. Mother-in-law didn't seem to like it either. She didn't want to leave the room and still complained to me. She continued to complain, saying things like, That's why you can't have kids. And, who knows if you'll live long? I just kept silent, pretending to sleep. I pretended to be asleep. Then, out of nowhere, she asked about today's coffee break. Is she really this stupid? I thought, opening my eyes to see her standing over me. Grace, I'm sorry. I'm not feeling well enough to go shopping today. Could you please? She cut me off. I don't care. I want chocolate cake now. Go buy it. You're probably faking it. She screamed at me louder than ever. My frustration exploded at the woman in front of me who was selfish like a child. Shut up. Listen to me. I have one month to live. Go buy your own damn cake, you idiot. What? My words seemed to stun my mother-in-law, who looked at me with wide eyes. Then, from behind mother-in-law, Mom. What are you doing? And Olivia, what do you mean by one more month? My husband, with a pale face, and my sister-in-law, who looked equally concerned, were standing there. Oh, 
Ah, weren't you coming back tomorrow? Ignoring the visibly shaken mother-in-law, my husband came to my side. I felt so relieved by his actions that I burst into tears. <laughs> I can't take it anymore. The doctor says it might be cancer and I'm not feeling well, but you keep nagging me to go buy cake. Enough is enough. Stop bothering me about the kids, too. Just leave me alone, you idiot. I let out all my resentment towards mother-in-law while crying. My husband and sister-in-law looked at mother-in-law with cold eyes. Sending a sick person to buy cake? Are you stupid? Sophia, who's usually all smiles, had a face I'd never seen before. A terrifying one. You've been making snide remarks about the kids. Look, I didn't say anything because it's a private matter. But the reason we can't have kids is me. My husband raised his voice as he said this. In reality, about a year after we got married, we consulted a doctor because we were having trouble conceiving. The test showed that I was fine, but my husband's numbers were low. He felt really down about it and kept apologizing to me with a sad face. I didn't want to make him feel that way, so I avoided talking about kids as much as possible. I did want children, but I thought life with just my husband was enough. I never considered leaving him because we couldn't have kids. I didn't tell mother-in-law because I knew she'd start nagging my husband next. I didn't want that. Mother-in-law listened to my husband's words with a face like her soul had been sucked out. Just then, my cell phone rang. The caller ID showed. It was the hospital. Hello? Yes? Right now? My husband just got home. Okay, understood. The doctor who had called earlier sounded very urgent, asking us to come right away. Am I really that sick? As I started to cry from the anxiety. It's okay, Olivia. Can you stand? I'm with you. My husband, who also looked like he was about to cry, and I rushed to the hospital. As we were leaving, I caught a glimpse of mother-in-law get a stern lecture from Sophia. When we arrived at the hospital, we were immediately ushered into a room where the doctor and even the hospital director were waiting to offer us a deep apology. A misdiagnosis? According to the doctor, they had mixed up my medical records with another patient who had the same name and birth date as me. I couldn't believe such a thing could happen, but the doctor did look extremely worn out. This incident was later covered in a local news segment, and the hospital vowed to review its working conditions. Um, I'm not a specialist, but Olivia's symptoms might be. We were then referred to another hospital. When we returned to my in-law's house, mother-in-law seemed to have been scolded by Sophia and was shrinking in her seat. Sophia later told me she was worried that her newlywed son might lose his wife and be heartbroken. It might be love turned inside out, but it was a real hassle. Seeing our tear-streaked faces, even mother-in-law broke down. Did I really do something that bad? <laughs> she started crying. So what about Olivia? Sophia asked with a concerned look. I'm... Pregnant, I said, tears of joy filling my eyes. My husband was also shedding tears of happiness beside me. We immediately went to the maternity hospital as advised. It's still early, but yes, you're pregnant. We can confirm the heartbeat. Hearing that, we both burst into tears, even though we were in a hospital. Sophia also cried, saying, I'm so glad, so very glad. As for what happened next, Sophia got engaged to her long-term boyfriend and moved to another state with him after quitting her job. We had heard about this before, so it wasn't a surprise. My husband, who was taking over as the new CEO, seemed to have his hands full with client visits. The business trip, by the way, was for that reason. He told me later that he was able to come home a day early because it ended sooner than expected. Mother-in-law seemed to know nothing about it. What? Getting married? Quitting her job and moving to another state? And was shocked. Sophia told her, Yeah, I told you, remember? Well, it doesn't matter. It's settled. Mother-in-law was in a daze. And we all laughed. <laughs> 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 
we returned home to find our leaky roof repaired and our room looking brand new. We cheered in delight. Things remained awkward with mother-in-law. My husband was angrier than I was and said he never wanted to see her again. But mother-in-law started showing up occasionally during our coffee breaks. Holding not cake, but small snacks like biscuits. She had stopped the daily cakes and jam steaks. Apparently, trying to be more health conscious now that she knew a grandchild was on the way. Employees who had worked there since my father-in-law was CEO seemed happy to see mother-in-law. So I realized she wasn't inherently a bad person. Our conversations gradually increased, and she stopped complaining. When our daughter Emma was born, mother-in-law transformed. She started doing things like buying diapers and leaving side dishes for dinner, saying, Feel free to eat. You're always working so hard. Even when she knew I was home, she'd send a message and leave without ringing the doorbell. The side dishes were in a cooler, and I appreciated her thoughtfulness. I felt I could get along with this version of mother-in-law. What really convinced me was when Emma was born. Mother-in-law took my hand and said, Thank you, Olivia. Really, thank you. Seeing her tears, I knew she was sincere. Sophia also seems to be doing well and recently announced her pregnancy. It seems like it won't be long before we all gather at the in-laws' house for a friendly meal. My name is Elise, a 33-year-old corporate employee. I've been married for two years to my husband, Luke, who's three years older and works at a sister company to mine. From the get-go, we've been living with his parents in a two-family home setting. Luke is the second of two brothers. He has an older brother named Cody, who's six years his senior. Before we got married, it seems like Cody and his parents were the ones living together. Cody's wife, Christy, however, is a chatterbox and pretty competitive. She often clashed with her similarly strong-willed mother-in-law. Eventually, Cody and his dad got fed up with these family squabbles and decided to move out. But Luke had been living alone since he started working, so neither of us ever really considered the idea of living with his parents. So when his mom abruptly announced, After you two get married, you'll be living with us. Not only were my parents and I shocked, but so was Luke. Why now? I thought we were going to live in my current apartment at least until we have kids, since it's convenient for Elise's commute. Wait, thought? That makes it sound like living together was inevitable. Despite that unsettling feeling, we realized the commutes would be roughly the same whether from Luke's apartment or his parents' house. Plus, their house, built by Luke's grandfather, is pretty old but has a main house and a guest house, so we thought we'd have enough privacy. So we agreed to move in. Once we did, though, I quickly regretted it. At that time, his mom in her mid-60s started complaining about back pain and dizziness. She pushed all household chores onto me from cleaning their house to laundry and shopping. I work full time, so even sharing chores with Luke barely kept our lives and his parents' lives in order. Then came the unexpected financial burden. Firstly, the guest house needed serious renovations. The guest house looked livable from the outside when we first saw it, but once you actually go in, there's no denying it needs more than a simple patch job. The bathroom, kitchen, roof, floors, everything shows significant wear and tear. But hey, it's our space. Of course we're going to pay for the renovations. What caught us off guard was when my mother-in-law saw the newly renovated guest house and demanded we do the same for the main house. Surely you wouldn't fix up your guest house and leave your parents to live in a rundown place. But we can't afford to do everything all at once. Why is Elise working then? to support us, her in-laws, right? Exactly, Luke. We blessed you with marriage. You should serve us in return. And so, not only did they want the house renovated, but they wanted new high-end furniture and appliances, saying the newly renovated rooms deserve the best. On top of that, they even make us pay for every little thing, from a single green onion to a roll of toilet paper. Despite trying to save by bringing our own sandwiches, my in-laws order delivery or dine out daily. And guess who pays for that? They use the family card that they made Luke get. Thanks to this situation, 
Luke and I struggle to save even a tiny bit of money. Every month, right before the credit card bill is due, we're stressing out, trying to balance the family budget. We've both talked to my in-law saying, Father-in-law, mother-in-law, we appreciate you, but you need to tone it down a bit. Luke even added, exactly. From renovation costs to daily expenses, utilities, and even property taxes, you're making us cover it all. Children supporting their parents is only natural. Yeah, are you out of your mind complaining about this? We'd been severely scolded, ending in a pattern where both of us would resort to crying to get our way. But even that lifestyle had gone on for over two years. Just as we were approaching the third year, my mother-in-law and the Cody couple suddenly told us, We're moving in. You have to move out. Christy told me that Cody got laid off, they said. Cody was actually spared, but chose to get laid off and said to save a colleague with kids. He's such a kind-hearted soul. But you have one-year-old twins yourself. How irresponsible can you be? How will you manage living expenses if you move in? Cody graduated from a prestigious university. Unlike you, Luke. He can find another job in no time. Then why does he need to move back home? He doesn't have a choice. He's living in company housing from his old job. He has to move out by the end of the month. Moving frequently with small kids is hard, you know. At least Christy isn't a disappointing daughter-in-law who hasn't given us any grandkids. What's your problem? So there we were, Luke and I, sitting on the floor for two hours in front of my in-laws on their comfy sofa. Finally, we'd had enough. Fine, we'll move out this week. Yes, we should, I said. We've learned plenty about family from you, mother-in-law and father-in-law. It's time to put that wisdom into practice, right, Luke? Haha, <laughs> finally getting it, are you? Yeah, just like Elise said, we're happy to do it. Great, case closed. <laughs> With that, Luke and I turned our backs on our chuckling in-laws and headed for the guest house. Two weeks later, we had movers arranged and relocated with no time to spare. We opted for the full packing service because time was of the essence. We timed our move during my in-laws' regular lunch and karaoke with friends, so there were no complaints about the stuff we were taking. We wrapped up all the formalities in three days, using up our paid leaves, and starting our new life until one day. I got a call from the front desk at work. Someone claiming to be family is here to see you. Whew. I had a feeling she'd show up soon, but I didn't expect her to barge in on me instead of Luke. <laughs> I quickly text Luke. Uh, she went to your place, huh? <laughs> Sorry for the inconvenience. No worries, but what should we do? I don't want to cause trouble at the office. Just tell them I had to step out for a meeting. Do you think that'll work? Heck, Cody has one-year-old twins himself. What's he planning to do about expenses if he moves in? Got it. <laughs> so, I passed the message to the front desk and my in-laws left as agreed. That night, as Luke and I pulled into the parking lot of our in-laws compound, our in-laws and Cody and his spouse rushed out of the main house and guest house to greet us. A closer look revealed that both mom-in-law and dad-in-law had a baby strapped to their backs, probably Cody's twins. Just as I was locking the car, Cody angrily yelled, Hey, how dare you show up here in my parents' cars? Luke coolly responded, Your parents' cars? Which ones are those? This seemed to anger Cody even more. The cars you both drove up in, obviously. I said, Well, Cody, both these cars were purchased by us. Our names are even on the registration certificates. Would you like to see? Luke added, Exactly. I've been annoyed by how our parents drive these cars as if they own them. We let it slide because we live together, but now there's no need to lend them out, right? And don't forget Dad-in-law has that old minivan he used for work, I added. Christy, who had been glaring at us, spat out, Who cares about that old car? To which I retorted, But it's perfect for twins, isn't it? You can fit two car seats. Our back and forth made our in-laws uncomfortable, but after seeing Cody get a talking to about the cars, they jumped in. What about the furniture and the appliances? Taking them while we're away... That's stealing. Not just from the main house, but also from the guest house. Yes, Cody and, and I can't live without those. That's when Luke said, why would we have to leave them? Look, I get what you're saying. We're using the guest house anyway, but there's no reason to dip into the main house too, as things started heating up even more. 
Why, isn't that stuff we all pitched in for? I asked, trying to understand their logic. Ugh, such arrogance. Even so, once you gave it, it's ours, father-in-law fired back. At this point, Luke chimed in. Whoa, hold on. We never gave you anything. We just lent it. There's no memory of us ever saying we're giving it to you. And there's no transfer of ownership on paper. Both father-in-law and mother-in-law looked utterly shocked at his response. Piling on, Luke continued. We were living together, so we lent stuff as a courtesy. Now that we're living separately, why would we keep lending you things? We just took back what's ours. Is that a problem? As we exchanged smiles. Everyone seemed to snap back to reality. Well, we have washing machines and fridges too. You don't need two of each, do you? Exactly, so why not lend it to us again? Yeah, wherever you've moved, stuffing everything into a small space will just make it even more cramped, they argued. Luke and I grinned at each other. Well, true. We're pretty packed right now. Absolutely, it's a tight fit, we agreed. Christy started to say, in that case, but we cut her off. Remember, it's a storage room, so it's supposed to be cramped, we chuckled. Exactly. Until the official contract is done, this is how it has to be, we concluded. This left Cody and our in-laws with a look of utter confusion on their faces. Then Luke dropped a bombshell. Oh, by the way, both of us are moving to Boston next month. From there, Luke smoothly explained that both of us had originally been offered positions at the corporate headquarters, but we had turned them down because we were living with my in-laws. However, now that the obstacle of living with my in-laws was removed, we had both accepted the transfers and happily received internal notifications for positions at the corporate headquarters. Even better, if all goes well, we could be working there until retirement. As luck would have it, Luke's colleague, who was going overseas for an extended period, wanted to sell his high-rise condo, so everything fell into place quickly. Wait, you guys are going to live in a high-rise condo in Boston? Man, life sure does throw some curveballs, doesn't it? <laughs> totally. If Cody and the gang hadn't told us to move out so they could live here, we wouldn't have stumbled upon this jackpot. <laughs> but how could we even afford a high-rise condo? That seems unreal. That's thanks to Elise's dad. He provided the down payment. Elise's dad just gave you the down payment? Yes, my sister is inheriting the family property, so this is sort of a trade-off. Plus, the previous owner said, I don't have a place to keep my modern altar. Can you hold on to it until I return to the country? I'll lower the asking price if you agree. So we did, and got a big discount. With that kind of discount, it feels like we're the ones ripping them off. <laughs> Hearing this, Christy, who was standing nearby, burst into tears. That's so unfair. I'd rather have a high-rise condo in Boston than live in Atlanta. Suddenly, the in-laws, who had been quiet all this time, switched gears and started fawning. Well... It looks like Luke really has it together, doesn't he? Like mother like son, Luke is following in my footsteps. <laughs> but Luke ignored them entirely. Turning to me, they said, Living in a high rise in Boston, everyone's going to be so jealous. When are you moving? We must visit. <laughs> Why visit for just a short time? If we're going to Boston, you should come too. That's an interesting idea, they chimed in. Hearing this, Cody and Christy stopped their arguing, snapped at the in-laws. Whoa, what are you talking about? Yeah, Cody's being downsized, so you're going to have to support us. Plus, until I find another job, Christy will have to go back to work early from her parental leave. You'll have to take care of her, household chores, and the twins. Cody and Christy, getting confrontational, marched up to the in-laws who were carrying the twins. The tension must have reached the babies who started crying, waking up the entire neighborhood. Noticing the neighbors who seemed to have heard the earlier shouting and crying, now gathering at a distance from the garage, the in-laws turned beet red. They looked at Luke again. Luke, say something to Cody and the others. Stop just standing there. Exactly. These guys are trying to take advantage of us, your parents. Luke laughed out loud. Ah, uh, so this is like a battle of wits between a raccoon and a fox, huh? Turning to the bewildered faces around him, he grinned and explained, if both couples, you and us, don't work, our family finances will collapse next month. Christy, fuming, asked what this meant. That's when I chimed in. Christy, you thought if Cody lost his job and you moved into the in-laws' rent-free home, you could just push the utility bills and groceries onto them, right? Well, our income was running this house, and you can't count on it anymore. I've never heard about this. Exactly why we're telling you now. Oh, and you'll also need to help with the mortgage payments for the house renovation. It's in father-in-law's name. 
What? Why is it in his name? At this, the in-law started avoiding eye contact. Luke took over. I wanted the loan in my name, since I was paying for it, but Dad insisted it would be shameful, so we used this property as collateral. Until now, we've been transferring money into Dad's account to cover the loan. Cody, you'll need to chip in starting next month. Of course, the in-laws and Cody were against it, but Luke firmly declined to continue payments. We're going to give up the inheritance, so Cody, as the one who will inherit, you better take good care of your parents and the family home, I firmly told him. When my mother-in-law insisted, but children are still obligated to take care of their parents, right? Luke brushed it off, saying, Well, considering we've been covering your living expenses and loan payments for the past two years, I'd say that pretty much balances out any future caregiving costs I'd have as a son, don't you think? Finally looking at me, he said, Let's go home, love. I responded, Goodbye, everyone. I doubt we'll meet again. Take care. The next day, Luke and I sold off the furniture and appliances we'd moved from the main house, along with two cars we wouldn't need anymore. When Christy texted us, if you don't want it, give it to me, I simply replied, why, and blocked her. After that, the special leave granted for our job transfer wasn't enough. We had to use up our remaining paid vacations to finally finish moving into the apartment. Buying the high-rise condo would take more time, so the first year, we decided to rent, thanks to the generosity of my boss who owns the place. The weekend arrived, bringing a bit of calm after the storm of recent days. Gazing at the city lights, Luke broke the silence. I know I've been a hassle this time, but thanks for sticking with me. What's with the formal tone all of a sudden? I joked, but Luke continued. When we first got married and the idea of living together came up, I should have thought things through. But back then, I was just happy you chose me over Cody, who I've been compared to since we were kids. He went on to say that we'd been mindlessly following his parents' wishes ever since. But then, when they told us to move out so they could bring in Cody and his family after the company restructuring, it struck me. How could they say that after being such a burden on us, financially and otherwise? And then I thought about how much your parents must worry about you, given your situation. So I sent an apology email to your parents. They responded, If you promise to make our daughter happy in the future, the past can be forgiven. So when they discussed the down payment, they lent it to us without a hitch. Then Luke promised to do everything in his power to protect our life together, just the two of us and our future children, if we were blessed to have them. On the other hand, it seems my in-laws are struggling, even pulling their retirement income. They can barely afford the loan for the home renovation. There's no way they can cover living expenses for two households. Plus, Cody's attempt to find new employment have been a series of failures. They're forced to make do with Christy's salary now that she's returned to work and what the in-laws earn from their part-time jobs at local senior centers. Arguments are frequent, often loud enough to hear outside the house. A former colleague texted me saying there's even gossip about them skipping town. Since they've cut off all contact with Luke and me, including anything that would require sharing personal information, they resorted to reaching out to my parents. But my dad, annoyed, changed his phone number immediately. Considering they had always belittled my family and didn't even bother with pre-marriage courtesies, changing a phone number is a small but significant step. Now they have almost no way to get in touch with us. What goes around, comes around. Seriously? What is this? She can't even make a decent meal. The voice of the mother-in-law echoes in the kitchen. Hey, that's way out of line. Talking back is pointless. Don't you dare talk back to your mother-in-law. Even with a husband who defends his mother, there's no one on the wife's side. I wanted to end this life but I had given up on thinking about it. My name is Alicia. I'm 32 and work as a nurse at a local hospital. Married for five years now, we want kids, but it's just not happening when we want it to. Working at a general hospital means night shifts and I'm feeling my age. Should I change jobs? I've been thinking about it a lot lately. There are other nursing jobs. I don't have to work at this busy hospital. A colleague who quit when she got married is now working reception at a clinic near her home. I'm so jealous. I never really considered quitting or changing jobs when I first got married. My husband Dustin wanted me to focus on housework, but I was stubborn. 
I was afraid I wouldn't be able to go back to work if I quit. Now, all my close colleagues are on maternity or parental leave, and I'm left to pick up the slack. Before I knew it, I've climbed the ranks to become second in command. It's fulfilling to be trusted with hospital-wide responsibilities. But there's a biological clock ticking. Shouldn't we think about having kids? I once suggested this to Dustin, but he brushed it off. Sure, when the mood strikes. Dustin and I are the same age. We met at a party when we were 25. He was always considerate, a real gentleman. He works at a major ad agency, so he's always well-groomed and has a lovely smile. I fell for him instantly, and we started dating after a few dinners. Everything was smooth sailing until we got married two years later. Now, he's gained weight and rarely smiles. We both have our flaws, but are we really a couple if we're just sharing a bed? We hardly have time for meaningful conversations. The only way out of this rut is to have a child. That's what I've been secretly thinking. Recently, another issue has come up. Mother-in-law moved in, and we never even agreed to it. It started about three months ago when my father-in-law passed away from a long-term illness. Mother-in-law, who lived just a five-minute drive away, started visiting us more often. That's all there is to sympathy. That would have been fine, but her visits became longer and more frequent. One day, I came home exhausted to find mother-in-law in the house. She had made a copy of our key. Eventually, she pretty much moved in. Later, I found out her house had been sold. There was no going back. Mother-in-law, this apartment is meant for two people. We can't just have you move in. I tried to choose my words carefully, but it was in vain. How awful! You want to kick out an old lady? I heard from Dusty Bear that you have an extra room, so I'm doing you a favor by living here. I'm your husband's mother, so just be respectful and deal with it. She talks down to me like this. We've never had a good relationship to begin with. Living together has only deepened the mother-in-law and daughter-in-law conflict. And Dusty Bear, really? It feels weird to have a nickname for a man in his 30s. What's worse, Dustin calls her mama when she's around, which gives me the chills. I suspect he was a mama's boy when we were dating, but seeing it in action is a bit much. I've heard that how a man treats his mother is a good indicator of how he'll treat his wife. I used to find Dustin's kindness towards his mom endearing. But now, it seems like all of his kindness is directed at her, not me. I've tried to talk to Dustin about the living situation multiple times. Dustin, we never agreed to this. Can you please talk to your mom? She's lonely since dad passed away. She lived nearby anyway, so it's not a big change, right? He always brushes me off like my feelings don't matter. Living together is way more stressful than living nearby. I'd even be okay if she rented the apartment next door, but sharing a two-bedroom is unbearable. I wish we could move to a place where we don't have to see each other all the time. Both Dustin and I have full-time jobs, so it's not like we're strapped for cash. We just haven't found the time to move. Hey, why don't we look at some new places on our next day off? Let's move somewhere bigger. You're the one who said we should save for when we have kids, remember? Stop changing your mind. Besides, I'm fine with this living arrangement. Aren't you benefiting from mom helping out around the house? You're fine because she's your mom! I wanted to scream, but what's the point? In the end, we've gotten nowhere, whether it's about moving out or living together. Today, I came home from work to more demands from mother-in-law. There's a Halloween tea party at Glenda's house next Tuesday. Can you prepare some treats? Next week, 
My shifts won't allow me to go shopping. Could you buy the ingredients yourself? I declined as I looked at my work schedule for the week. She has both the time and money, so why make such a request? Mother-in-law smirked and said, Store-bought treats would be embarrassing. Homemade is the way to go. That way we won't have duplicates. Oh, you mean the ingredients. What are you planning to make? My schedule won't allow me to go shopping. Before I could finish, mother-in-law cut me off. Oh, you're so clueless. Obviously, you're the one who's going to make them. You're so useless, haha. <laughs> and there it was, another verbal jab. I can't do it. I don't even have time to go shopping, let alone big treats. Please do it yourself. I tried to make my point, but mother-in-law wasn't listening. It's obvious who's more suited for this task between a full-time nurse and a retiree with plenty of time and energy. Still, mother-in-law persisted. Pumpkin cupcakes are easy. Just make the packaging Halloween themed. If you cut into your sleep, you'll have time. Forget and you'll regret it. Ha ha ha. She left me with those ominous words and retreated to one of the two bedrooms. Why do I have to do this? I was already tired from work, and this conversation just drained me even more. Does she not understand how crucial sleep is for a nurse who's in a physically demanding job? I felt a bit relieved imagining mother-in-law showing up empty-handed, but I couldn't ignore her. Last time I didn't meet her demands, she spread rumors that I was cheating on my husband. Clearing up that misunderstanding with the neighbors was a hassle. Then, Tuesday came. I sacrificed three precious hours of sleep last night to bake pumpkin-flavored cupcakes. They looked cute in Halloween packaging. Surely, mother-in-law would be satisfied. But when she saw them, she said, What's this? You made these? Wow, you're talented. Talented at wasting ingredients and money, haha. <laughs> I thought I misheard, but her words were clearly directed at me and my cupcakes. Um, I made them just like you said. What's wrong with them? And it's really unfair to criticize me after making me do this. Before I could finish, mother-in-law showed me a bag. Wrapped in department store paper. I instantly knew. She never intended to bring my treats. She just wanted to make me do the work. Rage boiled inside me. I was the fool for actually making them. I'm done being mother-in-law's puppet. What's in the bag, mother-in-law? You made me bake and then you went shopping yourself? Why are you always so cruel? Oh, did I say that? Just throw those trashy, uninspired cupcakes away. I can't bring them to the neighborhood tea party. I wanted to scream at this infuriating woman, but held back and started preparing for work. I barely slept less than three hours last night. I need to find a way to end this living situation and never see mother-in-law again. Why is Dustin okay with me suffering like this? Tears of frustration filled my eyes as I headed to work. Two months had passed since that incident, and today is New Year's Eve. We've managed to avoid any major fights, but that doesn't mean I've accepted this living arrangement. I've minimized conversations with mother-in-law to keep my irritation at bay. The hospital is busy during the cold season. It might not seem like much compared to doctors, but with increased appointments for vaccinations, this is the busiest time of the year. We're swamped covering for the doctors. Five years into our marriage, we didn't do anything special for Christmas. How could we with mother-in-law living with us? I just focused on getting through the hectic holiday season. I had thought about going on a trip for the New Year's holiday, but Dustin wasn't interested. Let's just relax at home during the long holiday. Why don't you take a break too, Alicia? Just then, mother-in-law walked into the room, her eyes lighting up. 
It's New Year's Eve today. You've prepared a special breakfast, right? You wouldn't skip that, would you? Both Dustin and I were taken aback. We usually went to his parents' house to make a special breakfast together. When I asked a month ago if we were doing it at our place this year, mother-in-law had said, I'll make it myself this year. There's less to prepare since your father passed away. Looks like we've been duped again. Dustin, who should have heard that conversation, said, Mama, we can relax this year. Alicia, better start cooking or we'll have nothing to eat. What irresponsibility. Wait, mother-in-law said she'd make it, but do we even have the ingredients? Both of them played dumb. If only mother-in-law, who usually takes the lead in making the special breakfast, would help. Ugh! Oh, of all times, she brings this up on New Year's Eve when stores close early. I rush to three different supermarkets. Even 24-hour stores were running low on supplies because of last-minute shoppers. Dustin and mother-in-law were happily watching year-end specials in the living room. While I was cooking, Dustin asked, What about seafood dishes? I checked the time. New Year's was just an hour away. With pots on the stove filled with meat and beans, takeout was the only option. Sorry, I'm swamped. Can you go get some takeout seafood? Dustin, who had no intention of going out, left reluctantly. I wouldn't be surprised if he didn't bring back anything for me. And why does he want seafood this year? We never focused on it before. As expected, Dustin returned with seafood for just the two of them. Here I am making sure we have something to eat, and he's blatantly setting plates for the living room. He didn't even offer to help, knowing I was struggling to make everything myself. Making a special breakfast takes a lot of time and effort. I was able to do that by preparing it in advance, and I was really tired of making it in a hurry. By the time I took a breather, dawn was breaking. Another all-nighter. But the dishes looked pretty good. Finally done. Now there shouldn't be any complaints. With that thought, I headed to the bedroom. The next morning, or rather just two hours after I collapsed into bed, I was awakened by noise in the kitchen. Mother-in-law and Dustin, who had gotten a good night's sleep, were probably ready for their special breakfast. Then Dustin came in and said something unbelievable. We're going out. You're probably tired, Alicia, so you'll stay home, right? Or do you want to go out for brunch? What? Brunch? My brain is already foggy from lack of sleep, and now it's filled with even more questions. I asked in disbelief. Wait, you want to go out for brunch? Right now? But I made a special breakfast, so we don't need to eat out, right? Well, yeah, but... I'm annoyed by Dustin's vague response and head to the kitchen. To my horror, my mother-in-law is about to throw away the food I stayed up all night to make. Hey, what are you doing? This trash is inedible, haha. <laughs> I thought I'd do you a favor and throw it away. Starting the new year with this? No way, ha <laughs> ha I managed to snatch the food from her, but in the process, some vegetables fall to the floor. Why is this happening to me? As I'm picking up the fallen vegetables, tears start to roll down my cheeks. Dustin, seeing all this, puts on his jacket without offering any help. All right, let's just go have brunch by ourselves, Alicia. Take care of the rest, haha. -ha. And just like that, they leave to enjoy their brunch. This can't go on. If we have a child, I can't raise it with Dustin. After cleaning the floor, I decide to eat the special breakfast I made. It's not bad if I do say so myself. Sure, it might not be as good as the special breakfast my mother-in-law makes every year, but considering I made it in a hurry, it's decent both in taste and appearance. As I'm eating, the intercom rings. Who could it be this early in the new year? When I go to the door, 
I'm shocked and decide it's time for revenge. Three days later, I'm packing up my things at home. All right, this is the last box. All that's left is to talk to my mother-in-law when she gets back. Just as I'm thinking this, she storms in. You've embarrassed me. What are you going to do about it? She yells at me. What's all the fuss? I haven't done anything. I reply calmly and she turns red. The neighbors are laughing at me. They're asking if I'm bullying my son's wife. They heard about the special breakfast. Clear up this misunderstanding right now. I didn't spread any rumors, but isn't it all true? Haha. <laughs> It seems the gossip-loving neighbors have spread the word about the New Year's meal. And what about Halloween? They think I wasted the treats you made. Now no one will invite me for tea. The person who visited me, left alone on New Year's Day, was Elisa, a leader in the neighborhood. I was surprised to see her at the door since we usually only exchange greetings. Elisa seemed to have noticed that I wasn't getting along with my mother-in-law. She was concerned after seeing my mother-in-law and Dustin go out together after the countdown party. It must be tough with your mother-in-law moving in, huh? She's been telling everyone that you and her son suggested living together. But everyone knows Crystal is just a neighbor and you're still young. They know something's off. Crystal is my mother-in-law. Elisa's words lift my spirits a bit. I had no idea my intrusive mother-in-law was saying such things outside the house. Elisa had asked me if I had any other interesting stories, so I told her about the special breakfast in the Halloween incident. It seems my mother-in-law's monstrous behavior is the talk of the town, and I couldn't be happier. She brought it all on herself. If she keeps complaining, worse things will happen to her, haha. <laughs> what do you mean worse? I've lived in this neighborhood for years. You won't be able to walk outside if you cross me. My mother-in-law retorts, mimicking my tone. Then, suddenly, the home phone rings. I answer it and quickly hand it over to her. Her face turns pale. What? The neighbors are watching a live stream of this room right now? What's going on? I show her my mobile phone, which is on the TV stand. I had been live streaming her bullying tactics, using a method Elisa taught me. What is this? She tries to snatch the phone from me, but I explain that the footage is already live streamed. About 20 people are watching since it's a holiday. Realizing that breaking the phone won't help, she falls to her knees and begs me to stop the stream. I was wrong. I've done terrible things. Please stop the stream. We won't be able to live here if people see this. Ignoring her tearful pleas, I respond. The one who won't be able to live here is you, not me. I'm staying. She's furious, but seems to realize that she can't walk outside anymore now that her bullying has been exposed. Her face turns blue as she begs for help. Then let's all move far away. Don't abandon me. You're really clueless, haha. <laughs> Dustin and I are getting a divorce. You're a stranger now. Please leave within a week, haha. <laughs> I packed a box in front of her. It's trash to me, but I've packed it for you. <laughs> yes, the stuff I was packing was for my mother-in-law and Dustin. I had already discussed divorce with Dustin last night and had him fill out the paperwork. I thought he would put up more of a fight, but he agreed easily. I found him an apartment closer to his work, so there was no fuss. Maybe he thought he didn't have to do housework because his mom was around. <laughs> From what I've heard through the neighborhood network, Dustin and his mom, who moved to the next town, are having a lot of issues. She's causing a scene at his workplace, demanding to be shown around because she's his mother. This has led to rumors about them being a weird mother-son duo, affecting Dustin's chances of promotion and causing him public and private humiliation. 
I can't believe that something like this happened to my former in-laws without me even knowing about it. I'm grateful to the neighbors who helped me and hope to help others who are being bullied by their in-laws someday. Made money off your clothes? Complain when you can make 4K a month. As a stay-at-home mom, I've been putting up with my husband and mother-in-law's atrocious attitude for too long. But this? No way I could let this slide. Fine, let's revisit this in a month. Fuming, I stormed out of my in-law's home. Then I made a phone call to a special number. A month later, just remembering the look on my husband's face makes me burst into laughter. <laughs> my name is Emma. I'm a freelance fashion designer. I used to work for a corporate design firm, but I've gone solo. The fashion industry is fiercely competitive, and freelancing has been tougher than I thought. With more freedom comes a higher chance of failing, and I often get yelled at for not meeting clients' expectations. Still, I loved my job, and that made it all worthwhile. My stubborn nature probably played a role in my success. I took setbacks in stride and fully devoted myself to my work. I still remember that time vividly. I studied hard, got my color coordinator license, and brushed up my social media skills. I wanted to cry at times, and I did. But I persevered. Still, with the support of people who encouraged me, I desperately worked hard. I kept pushing myself, pushing and pushing. As a result, now I can earn a decent income from this profession. I was enjoying life as a fashion designer, but recently something started to bother me, and that was, don't you think it's about time to settle down with someone nice? Absolutely, I've always been a career first person. Before I knew it, I was already in my early 30s. Work was so fulfilling that I barely noticed time passing. But yes, life's milestones were approaching. Marriage isn't a big deal. I used to laugh it off like that at first, but as I watched my friends one by one tie the knot, that's how I ended up marrying Noah, a guy I met at work. Noah is in the apparel business, a go-getter, and a real stand-up guy. It's probably thanks to his personality that things went smoothly all the way to the altar. So, Noah, about future work plans. Ah, don't worry. You can take the lead on home stuff. So, we decided I'd step back from my designer career for a bit. It's the division of labor thing, you know? That's why I've been really going all in on being a homemaker. As for going back to design work, I was thinking of picking it back up once things settled down a bit at home. Anyway, that was the new chapter in my life. I was living each day filled with dreams and hopes. Then, one day, Noah's dad passed away. His father had been battling cancer for a while, so it was just a matter of time. Still, his mom, Olivia, is really struggling with the loss of her long-term partner. Mom's really taking it hard. If she collapsed from the grief, it would be unbearable. So we decided to temporarily move into my in-law's home. Luckily, their home is spacious, with a separate guest house. We would live there and take care of Olivia, who was in the main house. Mom, if you need anything, don't hesitate to call on us. Olivia, lunch is ready. So I took on the chores in the main house, too, and kept Olivia company. Our dedication seemed to be helping. She was getting better day by day. I thought she'll be okay on her own soon. I was relieved and thinking of resuming my design work. But then... Emma, have you finished cleaning the main house yet? My mother-in-law just never seemed to pick up her share of the housework. Instead, she'd dump it all on me and go about her lazy days. And oh, she never missed a chance to complain. The food is bland. You don't do laundry properly. She'd nag over and over. At first, I reluctantly went along with her. But this felt like servitude, and I couldn't stand it any longer. I have my own work to do. I explained to her that I was busy with my design work, and asked her to handle the house chores for the main house. But then, you're busy. 
All you're doing is sitting in your room trolling. She wouldn't hear of it. To her, my work on the computer or social media seemed like playtime. I tried to explain further, but... Don't think you can fool me with those big words. My, aren't you cunning? She dismissed me with a wave of her hand. If I pushed any harder, she'd just shout, calling me a domineering wife. So there was nothing I could do but back off. Now what should I do? I talked to my husband about his mom, but he didn't seem to take it seriously. It seems he's also having a hard time at work. He sighs all the time, whether we're eating or bathing. Of course, as his wife, I tried to offer a listening ear. Sometimes venting can be a relief. However, Noah didn't open up to me about the details. Don't worry, I'll figure out the work situation on my end. Certainly, it must be a matter of pride for Noah. I was left to manage the difficult life with my mother-in-law without any help from my husband. Then one day, Noah comes home with a particularly dark expression. Turns out, he'd made a big mistake at work and lost an opportunity for a promotion. Mistakes happen at work. Don't beat yourself up over it. I thought I was giving him a normal pep talk, but it backfired with Noah, who has quite the ego. What would a homemaker like you know? My husband said, clearly irritated. Then my mother-in-law jumped on the bandwagon, blaming me as well. Don't you think Noah's failure is because you're not supportive enough at home? At their remarks, I'm momentarily stunned. No, no, this is definitely strange. Stunned by their accusations, I naturally fought back. But my words fell on deaf ears. It was decided then and there, I was the bad guy. From that day on, I was treated noticeably colder by both my husband and mother-in-law. Emma, can you hurry up with dinner? Emma, you were supposed to take care of the garden, remember? Emma, go buy some flowers for the living room. My mother-in-law became even more demanding, bossing me around. No matter how flawlessly I took care of the household chores, she'd always find something to complain about. Emma, you're sloppy with the cutting and the seasoning. It's too strong. Emma, I don't like how the garden looks. Redo it, please. Emma, these are lilies. I wanted your barras. At this point, all I could do was sigh. <sighs> I just wish someone would acknowledge my hard work. I tried talking to Noah again, but all he did was defend his mother. She's old, and she's relying on you. Besides, you have plenty of time, don't you? You're not working, after all. Noah still seemed resentful. I knew he had a big ego, but I didn't expect him to be this petty. And so, drained and weary, I soldiered on alone in my in-law's home. Then one day something happened that I simply couldn't tolerate any longer. That day, I had to go into town for some errands. After wrapping things up, I returned home. But the moment I opened my closet, I was shocked. What? Where are my clothes? Yes, almost all my clothes were missing. I rushed to the main house to confront my mother-in-law, who was leisurely sipping her coffee. Oh, I sold your clothes. <laughs> my mother-in-law casually admitted her deed. She said she sold them to a resale shop to help with the family finances. I was furious. More than furious. Those weren't just fashionable clothes. They were designs I had worked hard on, bringing them to life through my labor. Some were even from the early days of my career. Seriously. Who sells someone else's stuff without asking? I couldn't believe it. I let loose on her with all my feelings. But... Who needs fancy clothes when they're unemployed? <laughs> there was zero remorse from her. And my husband, who had come running after hearing the commotion, was no help either. If you have complaints, try earning $4,000 a month. <laughs> With that, Noah and my mother-in-law both mocked me. I responded, trying my best to stay calm. Fine, check back in a month. Both were stunned by my unexpected answer. Ignoring them? I got ready and left my in-law's house. I plan to live in a hotel for a while. The room is small, but it feels much more spacious than my in-law's home. This must be what freedom feels like. I lay on the bed and casually checked my phone. Several calls and messages from my husband and mother-in-law. Of course, I ignored all of them. Ugh, 
what a day. I tossed my phone on the bed with an exasperated look, but after a few seconds, I had second thoughts and picked it back up. I dialed a number. A month had passed since then. Right now, there's a big fashion show happening at the city's event hall. It's a collaborative effort between renowned fashion designers and popular models, and not just open to the public. Various industry insiders are also in attendance. I'm participating as a fledgling designer myself. Emma, long time no see. Emma, thank you for your help the other time. Emma, you look well. That's great to hear. Since many people from this field are gathered, I see a lot of familiar faces. I make my rounds and engage in lively conversation with people I've worked with before. Aiden, long time no see. Amelia, I should be thanking you for your help last time. Lucas, you're looking well too. Is Sophia in elementary school now? What a pleasant time this is. There was no shortage of interesting topics, including recent trends and industry developments. But then, someone rudely pats my shoulder. Ah, you're here too. I turn around and see my husband. So, have you come to your senses yet? You're stubborn, you know. At least respond. How about admitting defeat and coming home? Noah hasn't changed. Those were his words to his wife he hasn't seen in a month. I was so dumbfounded, I couldn't even find the words. I was brushing Noah off when a man rushes over to us. Ah, uh, do you two know each other? Ah, uh, Director Henry. Director Henry is one of the higher-ups at the apparel company where Noah works. Yes, she's actually, embarrassingly enough, my wife. She's so uppity. Even though she's unemployed, it's really becoming a problem. <laughs> With those words, Noah snickers. At that moment, Henry turns red and shoots Noah a glare. Emma, I apologize for my employee's inexcusable behavior. Henry, it's all right. Noah is watching our exchange, mouth agape. The truth is, Henry and I are acquainted. I had collaborated with my husband's company during my freelancing days, and Henry was the one managing the project. And now my husband is about to learn another shocking fact from director Henry. Emma is a renowned fashion designer. Don't you even know that about your own wife? What? Noah looks at me with astonishment. Yes, I used to be a well-known designer in the industry. Not to brag. But I was pretty popular on social media before I got married. Back then, I was pulling in tens of thousands of dollars a month, including ad revenue from social media. I kept that a secret from Noah. There never seemed to be a good time to tell him, and I didn't want to be valued just for my financial worth, so he probably thought I was just a mediocre independent designer. Sure enough, Noah starts to make a scene after learning about my background. I didn't know this about you. Well, I never told you. I had recently resumed my design activities, thanks in part to our recent argument. I contributed several designs to this event. I had been approached for collaboration before. The day my clothes were thrown away, I was meeting Matthew, my former boss, during my corporate design days. Apparently, one of their designers had fallen ill. That's when Matthew urgently asked me to take over as the lead designer for the fashion show. I had been hesitant since I had paused my design career. There was also the matter of issues at my in-law's home. But then, the big moment came. I called Matthew from the hotel to say I was on board and ready to go. You, being just a homemaker and unemployed. I could hear Noah's pride crumbling. I retorted with as much sarcasm as I could muster. So, we're good at 40k a month, right? Soon after, I divorced Noah. Emma, I messed up. Let's try again. You're the worst kind of woman for leaving your husband. Heartless, cowardly. Noah pleaded while my mother-in-law cursed me out. I dismissed them both. Come talk to me when you're making 40 k a month. Since then, I haven't seen Noah and his clan. From what I hear, Noah got demoted to a smaller department. He must have irked the higher-ups in the company. According to Mr. Jones, even previous work mistakes were due to conflicts with colleagues. Judging as lacking any remorse, he's been completely written off. They're still living in that house as they seem far from happy. I passed by their home once. It had a defeated aura. Well, they had it coming. As for me, 
I was recently in the spotlight again at a fashion show. My career as a designer is thriving. And life is busy but fun. By the way, things are going well between me and my former boss, Matthew. Matthew is a great guy who massively supported me when I struck out on my own. I trust him as a partner. I should have honed not just my design sense, but also my man-picking skills. <laughs> I chuckled at the thought as I focused on my work. What do you think? I asked. Why should I care? Make up your mind yourself. Lloyd brushed off the conversation. When I thought about how we could enjoy our remaining days in the Maldives without being bothered by anyone, my hesitation vanished. Once we got home, we quickly started packing. Can we move right away? Yep, we're good to go. We had movers come immediately and they began hauling away our packed items. Then we headed straight to the real estate agent. We'd like to sell our home. The agent was incredibly helpful and arranged for a same-day sale. Now, Lloyd truly had no place to go back to. My name is Marcy, and I'm 43 years old. I currently live with my husband Lloyd in a Manhattan apartment. We got married five years ago. We haven't had kids due to marrying late. Lloyd often says, Life isn't just about having kids. And that helps me live without feeling guilty for not being able to have children. Lloyd is 45 and in the prime of his working life. Recently, he's been working a lot of overtime and coming home late. I used to work at the same company as Lloyd, but quit after we got married. Lloyd said it would be awkward to work at the same company as his wife. Since then, I've been a full-time housewife. One day, my sister-in-law from the neighboring town called. It had been a while, so when she called to say she was concerned about our mother's condition and couldn't check on her, I agreed to go. Sister-in-law is a dependable person. I've been grateful to her many times since marrying Lloyd. Sister-in-law has two kids who are in 9th and 12th grade, and they're both doing well. I hold sister-in-law in high regard, so it's no surprise her kids are turning out great. Of course, I went to check on my mother-in-law the next day. It's easy to see why sister-in-law is such a great person when you meet mother-in-law. I adore mother-in-law. She's straightforward, has strong opinions, and is mindful of others. I feel truly grateful to have met such wonderful in-laws like mother-in-law and sister-in-law. When I arrived and entered their house, I was shocked. The place was a mess, full of clutter and trash. Uh, it looked like a hoarder's house. Something was clearly wrong, as mother-in-law is normally very neat. Mother-in-law was just sitting there, doing nothing, looking spaced out. I called out, Mother-in-law? She slowly turned her head and said, Um, who are you again? As she stood up, she looked at Lloyd and said, Oh, Lloyd. Welcome. We were stunned. Concerned by the sudden change in mother-in-law, we quickly made a doctor's appointment for the next day. After several tests, the results came back. She had dementia. Moreover, she needed long-term care. We called sister-in-law to come to the house and discussed what to do next. Taking care of someone long-term means that we'd need to look after my mother-in-law indefinitely at her home. Of course, public programs and private services are also options, but my sister-in-law offered, Marcy, thanks for everything. I'll take it from here. Surprisingly, Lloyd objected. No, your place is far, and moving your kids would be a hassle. True, my sister-in-law lives in the next town over, which would require her younger child to change schools. We should move in with my parents to take care of them. What do you think, Marcy? I was shocked. I never thought Lloyd was that responsible. Moved by his sincerity, I agreed. Of course, all for my beloved mother-in-law. And so began my daily caregiving life for my mother-in-law. We moved in with her and started our new life together. I managed the household and took full responsibility for mother-in-law's care. She'd wander off if you took your eyes off her. So I had to constantly watch her. Whether doing laundry, cleaning, or cooking, I was always monitoring her. 
Then I noticed she looked lonely. Was this life really making her happy? Even with dementia, she should still have moments of joy. Being under constant surveillance couldn't be fun. So I tried something. Mother-in-law, would you like to help me fold the laundry? Her face lit up. I'd love to. Though her hands weren't as nimble, she was clearly enjoying the task. I was relieved that I'd made the right call. From that point on, instead of watching her, we did things together. Seemingly, she found moving around less of a chore. On sunny days, how about we have lunch in the park today? That sounds lovely. And off we went for a meal outdoors. I never found this life burdensome. Sister-in-law always handled hospital trips, and her kids visited mother-in-law often. But one person was completely uncooperative. Lloyd. The same Lloyd who'd said, We'll take care of mother-in-law. He never lifted a finger to help. Sharing updates or asking for his input always met with disinterest or reluctance. When I'd ask for help, I'm tired from work. Why should I tire myself more at home? Was his response. He'd been working late, so maybe he was tired, but some help would be nice. He didn't even talk to mother-in-law. When I'd suggest plans for her, why should I care? Decide yourself. He'd brush me off. As it stood, it seemed Lloyd only came home to sleep. Things had gotten to a point where it seemed like Lloyd was coming home from work just to sleep. One evening, 11 p.m. came and went, and Lloyd hadn't returned. He'd often been saying he was working late, coming home just past 11, so I assumed that was the case tonight and went to bed first. However, I found it hard to fall asleep that night. As I lay there, the clock ticked past midnight. Where's Lloyd? I thought just as I heard a car outside. It's unusual to hear a car at this hour, so I looked out the window. The person getting out of the car was Lloyd, and in the driver's seat, there was a woman. They both got out and smiled at each other, and unbelievably, they kissed. Not just for a moment, they lingered. I spontaneously took photos with my phone, amazed at myself for doing it. The house has a bedroom on the first floor. Our bedroom window isn't far from the car, and the photos captured everything clearly. My hands were trembling from the shock. I heard the front door open and I rushed back to bed. Those photos would later become my trump card. From that night on, I started watching Lloyd more carefully. There were many suspicious signs. Telling me he was working late itself was suspicious. I knew what kind of work Lloyd was doing because we used to work at the same company. I know what kind of work Lloyd does, and it's easy to see that it doesn't require overtime. That kind of lie could be easily checked. So I called up an old colleague, friend. Long time no talk, what's up? Sorry for the sudden call, but I was wondering about Lloyd's department. Have they been really busy lately? Lloyd? No, I just got transferred from his department last month. It's not busy at all, actually. There's no way he could be doing overtime in such a relaxed department, which means Lloyd is likely spending time with his affair partner. My suspicions were confirmed. One morning, I saw Lloyd getting ready to leave with a large bag. What's with the big bag? I asked. Nervously, he replied, I have a sudden week-long business trip. Uh, take care of things while I'm gone. Where are you going for a week? Uh, I don't know yet. I'll find out when I get to the office. So I'll be going. And he left, evasively. I texted friend, Is anyone scheduled for a business trip today? I haven't checked, but shouldn't be. No big projects lately. Just as I thought. So he's going to be away from home for a week to meet his affair partner? Then my mother-in-law called my name. Marcy! She showed me a piece of paper. Written in Lloyd's handwriting were what appeared to be a hotel name, phone number, today's and tomorrow's dates, and a room number. What is this? Before doing Lloyd's laundry last time, I found this note in his pocket. I wish I had given it to you sooner. I'm sorry, Marcy. Do you also suspect Lloyd then? Marcy, we can't just turn a blind eye to this. 
Lloyd must be held accountable. There's no time for us to be down. The mother-in-law speaking was the strong woman I knew before her dementia. I felt more determined seeing this side of her after so long. Absolutely, I will not let him off the hook. First, considering mother-in-law's opinion, we decided to call sister-in-law. As soon as sister-in-law arrived, she said, Marcy, I'm so sorry. My brother is an idiot for doing such a thing. There's no need for you to apologize, I told sister-in-law as we planned our next moves. First, we checked the note and found out the location of the hotel. Lloyd was likely staying at this hotel for today and tomorrow. What would we do next? The next day, we decided to drive to the hotel in sister-in-law's car. We arrived at a hotel close to the airport and recognized a car in the parking lot. I looked at the pictures on my phone. Of course, they were the ones of Lloyd kissing another woman. It was the same car in those pictures. After a while, a familiar man came out of the hotel. It was Lloyd. We hid behind the cars to avoid being seen. Soon after, a woman came out and cozily linked arms with Lloyd. As I captured the scene with my phone, I couldn't believe what I saw. Both mother-in-law and sister-in-law were speechless. There was a little boy, about one year old, with them. The child happily held Lloyd's hand. The three walk happily. And they all walked off looking like a happy family. The real wife, me, was the one capturing this scene. Feeling miserable was the least of my concerns. The three of them headed to the airport, leaving their car at the hotel. Once they arrived at the airport, they laughed and killed time before disappearing into a flight gate. The destination was the Maldives. There was no longer any reason to hesitate. Thinking about how Lloyd would spend the remaining days there without any disruptions. When we returned home, we immediately began packing. I called a moving company and asked, Can we move out immediately? Yep, that's no problem. They came to help us pack, and we temporarily stored our belongings at sister-in-law's place. Next, we went straight to a real estate agent. I want to sell my house. The agent was incredibly kind and expedited the selling process for us. Now Lloyd had no home to return to. The thought alone made me feel refreshed. Afterward, mother-in-law and I checked into a nearby hotel where we would stay for a while. With that settled... There was something I had to confirm. Could the child with Lloyd's affair partner be his? To find out, I decided to consult a lawyer and a private investigator. The results of the investigation became clear right away. The report handed to me clearly listed that unfamiliar child as Lloyd's son. Lloyd had told me, kids aren't the only joy in life. But did he actually want a child? Did he have an affair because he couldn't have children with me? Only he knows the answer. But I can't keep this inside, as even my mother-in-law told me. I will never forgive him. Seven days later, my phone rang. It was Lloyd. Hey, where are you? I can't get into the house. The key's not working. That's because I sold the house. What are you talking about? Hope you enjoyed your six-day, five-night trip to the Maldives. Must have been fun with your family of three. Made some good memories, did you? Uh, I could tell Lloyd was stunned on the other end of the line. I continued, Your house is no longer there. We've moved and sold it. You should go back to your own child and that woman. Wait, you misunderstand. That's not my kid. I... I was fed up with Lloyd's excuses and unleashed all my anger. Don't you dare play games with me. You think your excuses are going to work now? I never want to see you again. For the first time, my usually talkative husband was silent. On speakerphone, my mother-in-law chimed in. Lloyd, just so you know, there's no escaping this. We have all the evidence and our lawyer is listening to this call. You'll be getting a compensation claim from Marcy, so pay it without arguing also, from now on, I'm cutting off any mother-son relationship with you. Don't think you can fall back on me, and you can forget about any inheritance. What? Mom, you're clearly not suffering from dementia. Can you believe it? 
I have genuine dementia, but listen, if Marcy is this hurt and in such a tight spot, how can I not step up? Marcy has been by my side, taking care of me all this time. I can't just sit around being a useless mother-in-law when I can't even repay her kindness. Hearing those words, tears flowed from my eyes, even after what my husband did to me. I felt truly blessed to have such a kind mother-in-law and a supportive sister-in-law. I was the luckiest daughter-in-law. Later on, Lloyd paid the $80,000 compensation I demanded, all in one go. Although it was a high sum, thanks to my excellent lawyer, we managed to secure the full amount. While evidence photos helped, the most impactful was the revelation of his secret child. Though my inability to have children played a part, that's a complicated feeling. I reported every detail of Lloyd's affair to his company, and he became the talk of the office, but not in a good way. Everyone from his co-workers to his bosses started looking at him coldly. Even after paying the compensation, his savings depleted. He couldn't afford to quit, and he's living a miserable life working under those conditions. His affair partner turned cold on him once the money ran out, and he isn't even allowed to see his child. Yet he still has to pay child support, leaving him in a dire financial and emotional state. My sister-in-law's eldest got into college and moved out, so my mother-in-law moved in with her. I bought a piece of land and built a small house there, starting a new chapter in my life. I'm using my qualifications and working from home. I'm never lonely because my mother-in-law and sister-in-law frequently visit. My mother-in-law's dementia seemed to miraculously disappear. Doctors say it's not a full recovery, but she believes it's all thanks to Marcy. I plan to find more joy in my life and live each day happier than ever before. We should take in my brother's kid. One day, my husband suddenly said that he would take over their child. He didn't even bother asking for my opinion. I'm reaching my limit with his increasingly arrogant behavior. I have to do something about this situation for the sake of my daughter and myself. My name is Carrie. I've been married to Scott for five years, and we've been together for seven. We have a lovely daughter named Tracy. She is three years old and has just started preschool. Life is simple, but peaceful and happy. I wouldn't trade my life with Scott and Tracy for anything. Then one day, Scott's brother Daniel got divorced. Daniel and his wife had a four-year-old son named Bobby, and Daniel took custody. But it seems taking care of the kid was harder than he thought. Soon after the divorce, Daniel left a note and disappeared, leaving Bobby at their parents' house. Scott and I were called to his parents' house for a family meeting. The first thing his dad said was, Scott, Carrie... Could you please take care of Bobby? I couldn't believe my ears. Wait, you want us to take care of Bobby? We're getting old and it's getting tough for us. You already have Tracy, right? What's one more kid? Um, that's a bit much. Scott's parents have high blood pressure and frequent doctor visits. His mom even had a stroke before so I knew they weren't in the best of health. I know it's hard for both father-in-law and mother-in-law, but we have Tracy, and taking on another child is just too much. Scott and I both work, so it's not like we're struggling financially, but that's beside the point. We're busy with work and already exhausted from taking care of Tracy and the household. We can't possibly take care of a growing four-year-old like Bobby. I decided to be upfront and declined right there. I'm sorry, but we can't take Bobby in. We have Tracy and we're both busy with work. 
His dad wasn't moved by my words and kept pushing. I'm really sorry, we want to help, but we can't. Can't you take him for a while? We can't afford it. I can't, I'm sorry. Then Scott, who had been silent, clicked his tongue and glared at me. Carrie, what's wrong with you? Excuse me? Don't you care what happens to Bobby? Well, your parents could. So you're just going to dump it all on them? You're the worst. Wait, what? How did this turn into me being the worst person here? I was just saying we can't take in another child because we have our daughter Tracy. Confused by Scott's outburst, I responded. Wait a minute, Scott. Like I said, we have Tracy. So what? Tracy is three, Bobby is four. They're practically the same age. Stop making a big deal out of one more kid. One more kid? Do you even understand how hard parenting is? We both work, we can manage. Don't you feel sorry for Bobby? Scott continued to blame me for refusing to take in Bobby. And what's worse, from his tone, it's clear he has no intention of helping out. I'm a parent too, and I do feel sorry for Bobby. But parenting requires a lot of commitment. Scott has never really helped with Tracy or the housework. I've been the one doing everything. If we take in Bobby, I can see it all falling on me. I have to stop this. Look, I can't do it. I can't give Bobby the same love and attention as Tracy. What? He's my brother's kid. How can you say that? Remember what I told you before? Bobby has been towards Tracy. Ah, oh, that story again. Yes, there's another reason I don't want to take in Bobby. He's always been clingy with Scott and me, because his parents never gave him much attention. That would be fine, but whenever Tracy comes around, Bobby becomes openly hostile. Hey, get lost! Don't come here! Tracy always starts crying at Bobby's words. Stop crying! Go away, you ugly kid! He's thrown toys at her and even pushed her down multiple times. Even if he's just four, I can't stand how Bobby harms my precious daughter. If we take him in, he'll surely target Tracy again. I have housework and a job. I can't watch them every second. I've tried to explain this to Scott multiple times. I don't have the confidence to care for Bobby properly. I don't want to start something I can't finish. What? Just try harder. He's my brother's kid. He's no different from our own. What are you talking about? They're completely different. I'm already overwhelmed with just Tracy. Scott doesn't lift a finger to help with our own child. He doesn't understand the challenges of parenting, so he can easily say, Let's take him in. As much as Bobby is family, my daughter is my priority. I can't love him the same way I love Tracy. The love for the child I gave birth to is unparalleled. If I go along with Scott and his parents, I'll regret it. If Bobby treats Tracy coldly and she gets hurt, it's all for nothing. I must avoid making Tracy sad at all costs. Like I said, I can't. If you want to take him in, you take care of him. What's that supposed to mean? We're taking him in so we don't burden my parents. That's final. Got it. Scott probably just wants to look like he's a good son to his parents. In the end, he unilaterally decided we take in Bobby. Something has to change. Feeling this way, I took Tracy and went back to my parents' home. I explained the situation to my mom who greeted us. So, that's what happened. Scott wants to take in Bobby without even listening to me. My mom frowned, clearly concerned. 
You've mentioned before that Scott doesn't really help with Tracy, right? Yes, exactly. He leaves all the housework and childcare to me. Taking in Bobby would just add to my burden. And on top of that, Bobby has been hostile towards Tracy. Yes, that's why I can't agree to take him in. My mom understands me well, as I often consult her about various issues. She agreed, saying, Taking in Bobby would only make things harder for you. I spent the night at my parents' home, indulging in their care. The next day, I found a slew of voicemail messages from Scott on my phone. Running off to your parents won't change my mind. Bobby was happy when I said he could come. Don't trample on a child's feelings. You're basically Bobby's mom now. Get back here and take care of the house. His unreasonable demands left me more stunned than angry. Ignoring his messages, I turned off my phone. Scott, reaching his limit, showed up at my parents' home. I can't keep running away. I decided to have a face-to-face -face conversation with Scott. We asked my parents to leave the room, creating a space for just the two of us. As soon as we were alone, Scott started yelling at me. Hey, apologize to me right now. What? What do you mean, what? Running off to your parents and neglecting the housework for two days? Apologize? Why should I? It's absurd that he expects me to do all the housework when we both work. Annoyed by his selfishness, I responded calmly. Do you still not understand why I went back to my parents? It's because you're not listening to me. What? I never thought you'd be so cold. Don't you feel sorry for Bobby? Scott, catching his breath, continued. Bobby is my brother's son. Then let me ask you, you don't even take care of Tracy. Do you really think you can handle Bobby too? Whatever, it'll work out. Bobby is older than Tracy. He can take care of himself. He might even be easier to handle. That's not the point. Bobby pushed Tracy before and couldn't even say sorry. He's not well disciplined. How can you say he'd be easier to handle? I can't do it. You're so stubborn. Scott sighed, looked at me, and said something unbelievable. Listen, you're my wife, and a wife is supposed to obey her husband. That means if I say we're taking care of Bobby, you have a duty to follow. Are you serious? I asked. Of course I am. You just need to listen to me. We're taking Bobby in. End of discussion. Scott slammed the table and glared at me. That was the last straw. I looked him straight in the eyes and said, can you stop? Why do I have to obey you just because I'm your wife? I'm not your personal servant, you know. What are you even talking about? The one saying incomprehensible things here is you, Scott. Bobby is just a relative to me right now. If we divorce, he'll be nothing. Do you get that? Wait, what? Scott was clearly shaken by the mention of divorce. Divorce? Why are you bringing that up now? We're not getting a divorce. Why do you get to decide that? That's up to me, isn't it? Don't tell me you think I can never dislike you, because I'm already fed up. You're joking, right? Do I look like I'm joking? I can't take Bobby in, emotionally or otherwise. It's just not possible. Scott finally seemed to grasp the gravity of my refusal. Still, he tried to maintain his composure and said, Stop it. If we divorce, you're the one who's going to suffer. Suffer? How? You'll be a single mom. Can you raise Tracy on your own? I don't see why not. What? Scott was dumbfounded by my unexpected answer. Regardless of him, I continued. 
I've been silent about this because of your pride, but I actually earn more than you. I have more than enough to raise Tracy on my own. That can't be. Plus, if we divorce, I'll move back to my parents' home. They adore Tracy and are much more reliable than someone who doesn't help with housework or childcare. What the hell is going on? Scott was stunned, clutching his head in disbelief. Realizing he couldn't win, he clenched his teeth and left without another word. I couldn't help but chuckle at the look on his face. I later found out that Scott had told his parents behind my back. We'll take Bobby in and Carrie will take care of him. How far will he go to save face? My refusal to take Bobby and my return to my parents' home threw a wrench in his plans. Scott and his parents were in complete disarray. We can't take Bobby because Carrie went back to her parents. It's impossible. What are you talking about? We already said we couldn't take him. You were the one who insisted. That's because Carrie's not here. Then you take him. You earn enough to support one child, don't you? Why should I take him? Send him back to his dad. His real dad. Scott exclaimed. We still had no idea where the brother-in-law was, and his ex-wife was unreachable. In the end, Scott had no choice but to take responsibility for Bobby. As for me, living apart from him made me realize there was no point in staying married. When I finally brought up divorce, Scott seemed to grasp the gravity of the situation. Over the phone, he pleaded, tears in his voice. I'm sorry, I'll help with the housework and child care from now on. Let's figure out what to do about Bobby together, okay? Please forgive me. No, I can't. What? Why should I believe you now? I've given you so many chances. I've asked you to help and cooperate, and you've ignored it all. It's too late to ask for forgiveness. But, but... I'm not heartless. If Scott had been helping with childcare and housework, if he had shown a willingness to work together on Bobby's situation, things might have been different. But the one who dismissed my feelings from the start was Scott himself. I'm not naive enough to believe his convenient promises. We officially divorced after that. Of course he's obligated to pay child support for our daughter. Between taking care of Bobby and now having to pay child support, his disposable income will likely shrink. He's still searching for his brother, but with no luck so far. Apparently, he's having a hard time managing Bobby. Well, he brought it upon himself. As for me, I'm living peacefully with my daughter and parents. I do feel sorry for Bobby, abandoned by his biological parents. But I hope my ex-husband learns just how hard housework and childcare can be.